distinguishes the United States as a nation from the rest of the world is that we believe our culture is universal. Our concept of life, liberty, democracy, freedom, we believe that those are not American values, but they are human values. They're endemic to human nature. Everybody around the world desires to be, a, to be like America. That is fundamental to how we see the world. And that's not true of other nations. In fact, there are only really two nations who sort of see their culture as universal, the US and France. France is the other country which sees their kind of you know, cultural values as something that are just not unique to them, but are sort of world culture. So that, that's an important point, because it's going to kind of dominate US foreign policy in the, in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. So there's this concept called the American century. <clears throat> now the US through the early part of the 20th century was an isolationist country, which means that we were sort of inward, we weren't involved in a lot of things, particularly after the Great War, which we now know as World War I. When this war ended, people thought that we would never see a war like that again. We would never see that level of destruction, that level of violence. And so it was known as the Great War. Certainly when 20 years later we have another war that ev that's even larger than the first war, it becomes known as World War I. And we have World War II where you know, 20 million Russians died during World War II. Just a massive, massive number of people who were, who were killed. So what happens after the Great War, we get the League of Nations, which is a sort of an international body that's designed to keep world peace. <clears throat> Obviously it failed. End up in World War II. After that, we end up with the United Nations, which still is, is a very powerful organization today. And what happens during World War II, the US is a late entrant into World War II. You know, the war starts in 39, the US comes in actively in 1940, 41, mostly 42 after the bombing of when the US actively joins the war. A man by the name of Henry Luce one of the most important media tycoons in American history started Time Magazine, Life Magazine. He was someone who was a shaper of American ideas. Came out with a book called The American Century. And what he said is that America has to export its values to the world if we are going to remain safe, if America is going to dominate as a world power. So World War II is really when the United States becomes a world power, really when it becomes actively engaged in trying to shape political systems, economic systems, and it's this concept of the American century. One of the things that begins to happen is that people around the world start to think about America differently. Anybody know America's great contribution to fashion? The most significant contribution America has made to fashion. Yes, it would be jeans. Jeans. What's your name? Michael. He's absolutely right. Jeans. A casualness. You know, if you look at pictures from the 1930s and 40s in Europe and things like that, people are going to the soccer day dressed in suits. They're going to lunch dressed in suits. And so there are certain aspects of American culture which come to dominate the perception of America as a young country. You know, 
young, hip, different kind of country. Blue jeans, rock and roll. Basketball, to a certain extent. These are the kind of images of the United States. And so all the older people think that the U.S. is sort of undermining um, people's people's uh, sense of European identity and Middle Eastern identity, but it's this youth culture which starts to kind of take over the world. And of course, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is um, one of the most significant companies to go abroad. In fact, there's a concept that people use <coughs> called Coca colonization. which is a, a way that people talk about talk about the growth of American culture, the most growth of American identity of all. And so it's a very important kind of concept. Now the U.S. is becoming a world player and wants to have more power, more influence. So what happens after World War II, get the founding of the United Nations, and now countries around the world who were under colonialism, start to get their independence. The first is India. 1946, India becomes an independent country. All throughout the Middle East, first sub-Saharan African country, Ghana, gains its independence, 1957. 1960s, 17 countries in Africa gain their independence. Comes a really big deal. On the parallel side of this, we also get the Soviet Union emerging as a world power at the same time as well. What happens? The United States drops the bomb in Japan. Devastation like we've never seen before. The US is now the dominant world power. The Soviets get a couple of spies. They steal the plans for building a bomb and build their own bomb by 1947. So now you have these two countries emerging as the two superpowers, both with the ability to destroy the country. And that dominates American society through the 1990s. Bomb shelter. You know, everywhere, neighborhoods, you know, some of us a little bit older remember, you know, having drills in school that were designed. The Soviet Union might bomb the U.S. What do we do? So you run down into the basement, hunker down, the desk. Yeah, th these were really active drills. This fear that the United States and Soviet Union were going to go to war and both having the ability to kind of destroy the world with their weapons. That's the Cold War. What happens in 1947 is the Truman Doctrine. Yes? Well, you said so the Cold War was the Soviet Union and the United States taking on the war? Yeah, it, it, was, it was the idea that you had two um, different <clears throat> political and, and uh, sociological systems, two different systems. You have the American capitalist democratic system and the Soviet communist system. And this idea that they can't sort of exist together and that they're going to end up going to war for world domination. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I understand. Okay. Yes. Time period starts with the Truman Doctrine in 1947, so right after World War I. World War II, excuse me. And it goes until the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is about 1990, 1991. So about 50 years, 40, 50 years, where this is the dominant sort of struggle. So the Truman Doctrine, issued by President Truman, says that the United States will fight on behalf of people Anywhere where the Soviet Union is going to try to come in and institute communism. So that's 
So basically says that we are going to fight Soviet Union anywhere that it's a threat. And that's based on something called the domino theory. They're and, pretty much scared anytime we just go out of here with food. Like something's gonna happen. Exactly. It's crazy. Exactly. And both of them have the bomb. So the domino theory is that you cannot allow communism to root itself in any country because then it spreads. And so you have to fight them everywhere. So what happens, so this is the climate in the late 40s, early 50s. We've just gone through World War II. Europe, devastating. Countries, all the, the drop the bomb. It's hard to imagine that world now, you know, in 2015. But this scared people like you just couldn't imagine. Can you imagine just being here and all of a sudden a bomb drops and everything in 10 miles, within 10 miles, is no more? And it happened. And you have two countries opposed to each other who are threatening each other. And so it's a new world order. Yes? Why, why did the people in North Vietnam kind of put up that final act? You know, like they thought that it was keeping the earth. Like it was kind of like just a huge standoff, right? So why was keeping them trying to build? Was it kind of like one waiting? Yeah. Cause I know, like, uh, like I know, like we we know, like, like we know, like the war, you know, like the shock that went around the world. Yep, yep. We, we don't know who started it, why yep. it's happening, but so what kept them going? Those three. I think there there are a number of of things. One is that you really don't know what was going to happen when you when you watch the bomb. You know, then does the the. Uh, air pick it up and it starts to travel and then the trade winds bring it somewhere that, okay, so that like you hadn't possible, intended. Yeah. So the so consequences of the unknown after the fact. The unknown. Oh. Yeah, it's the it's the unknown. You don't know if there is a is a weapon system set up. There was this talk during the Reagan years of something called Star Wars, which is essentially putting this um, weapons defense system in space. So if the Soviet Union sent weapons in, you could shoot them down. But you never knew what would happen. It disintegrates, now it's over the city. Did the Soviet Union have technology that we didn't know about? And so there's millions and millions of dollars put into it. And you just don't know what they're developing. You don't know if what you have is really gonna work all the time. So, and then you have all of these, so what happened? is you have the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And what they attempt to do is to make every country around the world pledge allegiance to either the Soviet Union or to the United States. Yes? And can you just refresh, like, what countries are in the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union is largely Russia and all of the, the states that have sort of kind of gained a little bit of independence lately, Georgia, um, the Ukraine, and you guys heard this the last couple of years, this idea of Ukraine and, and the United States is pushing, you know, we need to get the Russians out of Ukraine and Ukraine needs to be, this is pretty dangerous because Ukraine borders Russia and this could lead to an inflaming of these, this sort of rhetoric and the danger is that Ukraine gains independence from Russia, then it becomes part of NATO. And what NATO is, it's an alliance which basically says that if any NATO country is attacked, every country in NATO agrees to come to their defense. So then you would have a NATO country bordering right on the border of Russia. That would create tremendous instability and probably uh, undoubtedly intensify. And that's why you see so much battling over Ukraine, because the Soviet Union is like, no, you cannot established NATO and the EU in a border country. So that's one of the, the big kind of political issues that's going on in the world. 
right now. Yes. Sorry. Last question. Do you think no, that please, please give out the minutes? Would they hit DC first? What'd you say? Would they hit DC first this round? So it's always so supposed to be the Well, um, it depends on where they strike from. You know, um, certainly if you're if the if the strike is coming from Russia, it's going probably going to get to the West Coast. One of the major things that happens is in 1959 the Cuban Revolution. Cuba became communist in 1959, and Cuba is about 60 miles from Florida. So then part of it was, are the, the Russians going to stockpile weapons there where they can hit the U.S. a little bit closer? You just don't know. Like, for example, um, and this is one of the reasons why we didn't have it, because sometimes you have strategies and you have ideas and people outsmart them. Like, for example, you think about the 9-11 attack and the Pentagon. The Pentagon was well prepared. Let me put this up here. Now, this is not going to be geographically correct. <laughs> Jamie, use this pen. I think this pen might be better. Okay. All right. So let's just say this is the U.S. coastline. This is D.C. This is the Pentagon. The Defense Department, the Pentagon, CIA were all prepared for an attack to come this way from the Atlantic Ocean. They never thought that the Pentagon would be attacked from a domestic, domestic space. Had no defense set up. Had no military fly zone. But that's what that's the fear. And so do you see movies on it now, like you know, they knew the president the movies like the White House getting yep. it. And they always just realize these people they're always ready. Well, they always die, but they usually always ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, do we know how? I guess they informed us that they had stolen the plans and had them. Because you said that the Soviets had all spies. So did they get the plans and then kind of like inform the U.S. Oh, we have the plans now, and that's how it started, or was it kind of like they never really got proof? They just assumed that they had it. Like how? No, they were very explicit about being able to make the bomb okay. because it changed. The, um, it changed the power dynamic. Changed the power dynamics tremendously. Okay, so they kind of sent them proof that they had the power. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. yep, yep. So they were very, very explicit about it. Now countries are less likely to want to talk about having it because you'll, you'll uh, face a lot of repression and things like that before you can formally develop. It takes a lot of a lot of natural resources. It, it's, it's really hard to create a bomb like that. Wasn't so. that why we went to war? Because Bush was saying that they had weapons of mass destruction and that was their main focus as kind of a dual thing. And he, like the Saddam Hussein, yeah, that's, and Laden, and that's, that's a big part of it. You, you know, that's the, there, there are a couple of things you can rally the world around. Most of the world is more wary, doesn't want to become involved. But if you say weapons of mass destruction, or you say they use chemical or biological weapons. So that's why you hear, to me, I, I don't think any, I don't think Assad is using chemical or biological weapons in Syria, anybody around the world. But those are the things that will bring people off of the sidelines. And so you always will hear these stories, you know, possibility of chemical warfare, biological warfare. And that's the that's the line most countries are not willing to to um, to just stand stand quick with. Okay, so this is the Cold War. Let's just sort of do a little bit of review. End of World War II, U.S. develops the bomb. Soviet Union develops the bomb a couple of years later. Nations in Africa, Asia, Latin America begin to gain their independence. And now it's a battle to figure out. Who are they going to align with? Now, Spain is an ally of the United States. Belgium is an ally of the United States. Britain is an ally of the United States. Italy is an ally of the United States. France is an ally of the United States. 
Now, I mentioned those countries because those are the colonial powers that had dominated Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And they're all aligned with the United States. So then the Soviet Union goes to the countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and say to them, look at how you've been oppressed by these countries. Look at what these countries have done. Why would you align with them when they treated you this way? And then what they would do is go clip out newspapers from the U.S., clip out newspapers from the New York Times, African Americans lynched in Georgia today. And then they would send them all over the world. This isn't our propaganda. We took this article. This is the Washington Post with a picture of a black man who was murdered because he owned a successful business. And that's the, that's the truth of lynching. Most people think lynching was about interracial romance. Most African Americans who were lynched, and this is say Kanye's work, I learned this from him, were lynched because they were prosperous because they, they didn't stay within the box of being a sharecropper or being poor, but that they were economically successful. <clears throat> and so then they would send these things. And so now the United States has to battle for the allegiance of people of color around the world. And that's where sports come in, and music. And so this is when I start writing about this, this particular topic because it's important to the civil rights movement in the sense that, you know, the story that we hear about the civil rights movement is, and this is true, Martin Luther King Jr., a number of African Americans began to protest, began to march, and then people sort of realized that it was wrong to, to discriminate and so then they began to give African Americans their rights. It's the dominant narrative. What my work does and other people's work does, um, argues is that what leads to civil rights reform is not the goodness of America or the, the, the idea that people just all of a sudden realized that it was wrong to discriminate. What I write about are the ge geopolitical implications and consequences of segregation consequences of racial violence in the United States. So if you are trying to get people around the world, people of color around the world to align with you, and they say, why do we want to be affiliated with you when you treat your, your own citizens this way? That becomes the big albatross. That becomes the big the biggest problem in US foreign policy becomes American race relations. Yes? So it's basically, are you saying kind of like the foundation or a large motivating factor was basically the political result they were hoping to achieve and being able to sway both independent countries to join them in this long term? Is that what you're saying, basically? Yes. Like, okay. I'm saying that it was the, the <laughs> geopolitical consequences of American race relations that caused civil rights reform. Yeah. So, during the war, there's still lynching going on? Yes. There's still lynching today. Yes, during the war. It was very common. During, during World War II, you had something called... Have we talked about this with Double V? This idea of the Double V. Victory at home, victory abroad. And essentially, African Americans were making the argument, why are we going to Germany to fight against anti-Semitism and not being willing to take on racism in the United States? So victory, at, victory abroad and victory at home. So African Americans' participation in the war is designed to kind of say, look, we're willing to fight for democracy and freedom there, we should also have it at, at home. And so there's always been this kind of duality taking place in that, in that war effort. Um, but
but yeah, cer certainly I, I'm saying that that it's the, the political implications of race that, that lead to, to civil rights. Right. No. You know, like, well, I mean, you never even heard about our relationship between the Cold War and the Civil War. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Were they getting treated wrong by helping out in the war? African American? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because what happened is that often in Europe, uh -huh. the, the uh, African American soldiers would fight under the French army or they'd fight under the Italian army. And so the United States government tried to set up segregated living quarters. Yeah. And the French government's like, these aren't our laws. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we don't practice segregation here. Yeah. And so a number of African Americans in World War I and in World War II go to Europe and experience freedom like they've never had in the United States. And so that becomes a very important, a very important um, turning point where people begin to imagine and to live a different world. But it was also very common for soldiers to come back and be lynched or to be be beaten in their uniform. People right. would, would, the war. Yeah, the people war. would come out, you know, strip them of their uniform. Because they were saying it doesn't matter. We're not. We're not. We're not going to overcome segregation. Yes, thank you for serving, but your we don't want you. Yeah, your service doesn't mean anything. And so there were there there are at least five instances of people being lynched in uniform, and plenty others being beat up, as a way of kind of saying we're not changing. And so it's the Cold War. And the battle for Africa, the battle for the Middle East, which I think leads to civil rights reform. Now, my book is the, is the, the middle here, and what I what I try to argue is that before the United States government committed to reform, they tried to manipulate international perceptions of American race relations. So that's what the book is about. It's about sending athletes abroad to make claims about. Um, racial progress. And it's interesting because most of the athletes did not know that's why they were being sent abroad. It was essentially something like the NCAA or the NBA. Yeah, we're going to sponsor you on a trip. Just mm -hmm. go kind of play basketball. And I start the book, if you read, read it, with Bill Russell. This is an interesting guy. Talks about not even knowing. You know, just at the time, the Amateur Athletic Union was the dominant international, um, the dominant uh, amateur sporting body. And it wasn't the NCAA, it was the AAU. The AAU just calls them up. We want to send you on a tour, tour to go play basketball. And that's essentially all he's told. But the State Department had set that up because they wanted to, to, to put out an image of a prosperous African American. He was college educated. He was successful, and so, yes? But at this time, weren't were teams still not, they weren't integrated yet, right? So were they sending over, they were sending over all black teams, or they were sending over integrated teams of black and white teams? It's a little were bit of both. The teams are integrated by this point. Teams are, teams are starting to get integrated. This is, this is the 1950s, uh, 1950s. So teams are integrated by the 1950s, slowly but surely. In basketball, there's still this saying um, during the 1950s that at home, you start two African-American players. On the road, you start three African-Americans. And you play five when you're down with five minutes left to go in the game. That was a saying that people talked about the 1960s and the racial kind of politics. Because it does matter. It does matter how sports get integrated. And I should say there's a side note about sports and their integration. Um, if you come to the museum when it opens, I'm the sports curator, and we've got about 5,500 square feet devoted to sports. And we talk about this a bit, that you know, even when you get integration of sports, there's still some segregation. Like in basketball, the first generation of black basketball players are all defensive players. They're not the leading scorer. Is, um, you don't want African Americans to be your star player. Um, they don't play point guard, which is the thinking position, the leadership position. So there are still some racialized ideals at, at play here. But let me not get too far from that. 
So, so then what I, what I talk about in the book is I'm sending a number of African-American athletes to try to project these images, or they send integrated teams, you know, who are sort of high-fiving and interacting on the bench, laughing and cheering while playing the game. And so the athletes don't make speeches, but it's that... Oh, so it's like a visual... It's a it's visual. visual perception. It's a visual perception of the interaction between the races. So it's not that they're separated or the whites play and then the blacks don't play. It's, it's about creating a different narrative. And the target audience was, were kids. You wanted to reach kids before they developed hostile anti-American attitudes. And so that's why you use basketball, that's why you use rock and roll, that's why you use um, other aspects of culture because you want to you want to influence the youth um, and keep them from developing hostile attitudes towards the United States. You want them to see the United States as this kind of pinnacle of society. Yes. I'm just curious. So we know, like, basically, America is founded on Christian society. Um, do you know what the dominant religion in the Soviet Union at this time like has been? Is it the Soviet Soviet Union denounces religion? Um, as a tool to kind of control people. So there is no dominant religion. It's, okay, a, so it's, a, it's, an, it's uh, an agnostic society. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so that's essentially what the book is about. It's about the failure of the propaganda campaigns. And one of the chapters, chapter four, I think, I think that's one that you're supposed to be reading, is about Little Rock. And Little Rock is 1957, 1954, we get Brown versus Board of Education. So the schools, the high schools at Little Rock are trying to integrate. And it just becomes a nightmare. You get parents there yelling it, and little kids, little girls, little boys just trying to go to school. And so ultimately, President Eisenhower sends the federal troops in. And that's a really big deal because this was the first time the federal troops were sent to protect the rights of African Americans since Reconstruction into the South. So this becomes this huge deal, and that breaks with tradition, him sending the federal troops. But it becomes an international issue like you couldn't imagine. This becomes the dominant story about the United States. The United States won't let little African American kids go to school. And so the Soviet Union is is talking about it, nations in Africa are talking about it, how can we align with the United States? Well, at the same time that that's going on, there were two major African-American athletes at the time taking goodwill tours. Rayford Johnson, who um, was an Olympian, won the decathlon, which at the time was one of the biggest sporting events. You know, you do 10 different events at the Olympics and a guy named Mal Whitfield, who was a middle distance runner, probably the greatest 800 meter and 10,000 meter runner in American history, both African Americans. They were both on Goodwill tours at that time. And you just see that their tours and the Goodwill that they are bringing about can't compete with these images from Little Rock. And that is ultimately what sort of breaks the back of these kind of um, protest gestures. Little Rock, Birmingham, the, the sit-in movement, African-Americans just sitting at a lunch counter, drinks poured on them. African-Americans marching down the street, water hoses. Those images become too powerful for a propaganda campaign to undermine. And so it's it's based on this international pressure from nations and, and African Asia. Anybody read the autobiography of Malcolm X? It's an interesting book. It's one of my favorite books. When Malcolm X is right before he dies, he says he wants to take the United States before, before the United Nations for violation of human rights and essentially drawing on this momentum of countries in Africa and Asia standing up to the United States. Um, and so I think it's, it's very much true that, that it's the international pressure more so than domestic compassion 
that leads to, to civil rights reform. Now what happens, and, and this is why I believe that, because there's a point where it ceases to be effective. And that's by about 1966, 1967, where the US realizes that yes, people hate our race relations, but they won't hold it against us. And most of the countries by that point had already picked who they're gonna be in, in alignment with. And that's when we began to see a major slowdown in civil rights reform in the United States. We began to see the kind of collapsing of, of the movement and seeing it not being as effective as it had been. And that's partly why you began to see um, the black power movement sort of take powers because these civil rights tactics are no longer effective, largely because that the international countries aren't as concerned. Or it's, it's not that they're not as concerned, is that the United States is not as fearful of the international countries not being aligned with. Yes? I have two questions. Uh, so who's, who is at this time funneling these images? Since isn't the media largely going to be controlled by the dominant Well, it's going to be white, and then they want to protect the integrity of the image they're wanting to portray. So how are they getting, I understand, you know, the media and everything, but they, even during this time, obviously, when there aren't a lot of, like, uh, media outlets that are black and black people are using their words and they're using silence. So, so who is funneling the, all of Which the Little Rock image? Nine? The Little Rock? Like, all of, those, all of these negative images of race relations in America, who is funneling them overseas, and how are they getting... That's a good question, because one of the other things that helps propel the civil rights movement is television, the emergence of television. It's weird, you know, like if you think about television in the 1940s, if you wanted to watch television in the 1940s, you normally went to a bar. You went to a bar, and people, you know, televisions, they were really expensive, and that's where you watch television. By the 1950s, now people are starting to have televisions in their homes, satellites, um, the ability to kind of have visual images going all over the world. I think so it's that technological change as well that becomes important. On the flip side, the State Department, the CIA, the um, United States Information Agency created newspapers all around the world, created radio programs to kind of, to kind of um, Stay try to control the, the sort of messaging oh, as well. Okay. So tremendous kind of access to media like never before so it was kind of just during this time, time period. The fact that it was just a matter of time to fall into the wrong hands just because of the fact that they were really I'm not following you. So you're, are you just saying like because they were already connected internationally, like they weren't just, like you just said that they had. I'm not following you. Here you rack it up and kind of make it clear for them. So okay, why, so did, who, why didn't the US like stomp out the people then just from getting out? Why didn't they stop them? I think that's what you're asking. That's what you're asking? Yeah, because you just said out. you just said that the CIA, U.S. information, you said that they had networks based that were not just in America. Yes. So they were all communicating with each other. So how did it get into the hands of the U.S. Now? How did what get in there? The images, like negative the images. images. Yeah. Well, we have we have the First Amendment is the freedom of the press, and what happened in this time period is that coverage of the civil rights movement um, was incredibly profitable for news, for um, television. You know, if you wanted to be a major news outlet, ABC, NBC, you had to be covering the civil rights movement. And so to the extent that the United States government wanted to kind of suppress these things, um, the First Amendment um, made sure that, that, that um, people could get these images and they would get them in, in the U.S., and then be sent abroad. And as I said before, the Soviet Union and other interested countries countries would just take US media and share it with the world. Yes? Is the Soviet Union criticized for their use of propaganda? Yes. Yes, certainly. Um, they, were, they were criticized by the United States, which sort of denied that it had a, a propaganda campaign. Is that um, considered propaganda? Hold on. Um, so there, there are a number of people who who, who thought that, that the use of propaganda and the use of um, 
this in imagery was manipulated. And that's one of the reasons why the Soviet Union often used American-based media to kind of challenge those, those ideas. And of course, the United States had its own propaganda against the Soviet Union um, that sort of detailed um, some abuses in the Soviet Union. But so it's a battle. You're still battling and, and both portraying each other in the most negative light possible. Any other questions about about this? Yes. Is that, is that considered propaganda? Yes. Oh, okay. Anytime you are trying to manipulate and 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 um, control how people see a particular issue, it's it's propaganda, and it doesn't mean that propaganda is always negative. Um, but propaganda can be true. It just is about manipulating people's perceptions. Yes. Do you think Brown versus Board of Education? One of the things about Brown that, that sort of suggests that is hours after Brown passed, there were cables sent out all over the world. And so I don't know that it's the only reason that it was passed, but more than likely, because here's the key phrase of Brown. All deliberate speed. Now your eye is drawn to this word, but this is the key word. There were schools in 19 school districts in 1967 that still weren't integrated, 13, 14 years after Brown. Um, and so it was great that you're we desegregated schools, but you've given the power to the local schools to, to begin to set up their own strategies. And many of them just merely delayed, 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 filed lawsuits, came up with uh, thinking panels and things like that. So it's the deliberate. But in terms of the propaganda, the United States government was clearly kind of pushing this as a way of demonstrating um, the openness of American society. So it's that phrasing which is is manipulative. I'm glad we're getting to the questions. We only have about a couple more minutes left. Um, I thought about this. Do you think it works in terms of the athletes? Does it, did it work, at least in the time period you're looking at for propaganda? More effective than, say, setting a president abroad? Or Here's the other thing, the one thing I didn't, didn't talk about, was that the Soviet Union didn't participate in the Olympics from about 1912 to 1952. So the Soviet Union comes back into the Olympic um, movement. And, and remember I was telling you, like, both of them have the war, they have the bomb, and so they're trying not to go to war. So they fight these wars in all these other places in sports in the Olympic Games becomes one of those ways. So it's who wins more medals, and, and if the Soviet Union means wins more medals, it means the communist socialist system produces the best citizens in the world. If the United States wins more medals, then it's the American capitalist system that is the dominant system in society. One of the interesting things about how they use the Olympic Games is largely if you include Women's sports, the Soviet Union wins. If you don't include women's sports, the United States wins. And so what we see in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is a de-emphasis of women's sports. And women's sports loses a lot. They lose a lot of opportunities to compete um, because of the Cold War. You know, sports are unfeminine, and you get these ideas of the, the Russian Amazon women who are not real women. And, you get all these kind of things playing out. So what elevates the sports is the Soviet Union coming back in and then the Cold War. Um, the Soviet Union is coming back in and then these Olympic medal counts become really serious business. Thank you.
So I think sports um, definitely is 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 uh, is an important battleground. The other thing about sports is number one, you don't need language. You know, we can watch sports. You know, we watch soccer. Well, you know, I don't need to understand what the the language, but you can see the visual. So it allows you to communicate across barriers. One of the other things why sports is really important, I think this is not as true of your generation, but traditionally people don't think about sports as containing ideological content. They don't think about sports as messaging and sports as a way of kind of influencing how we see the world. But sports is, is incredible for a, an incredible tool to transmit messages. One of the reasons is because a lot of American culture, countries wouldn't have let come in. There's a lot, oh, we don't want your movies, we don't want your music. But sports, oh, bring sports in. Because they don't think of sports as socializing, and creating ideas about who we are and challenging them. So it, it was a very effective propaganda tool. The other reason why they're using sports is partly racist. Sports are about making an emotional connection, you know, and so it's this idea that people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America aren't intelligent enough for us to reach them with literature or for us to reach them with classical music. They're quote unquote emotional people, and so we'll send something like sports to kind of engage them emotionally. So it's a sports is a very effective sort of tool to kind of our message. Yes? Uh, so you said from 1912 to 1915? 1916 to 1952. Yeah, 16 to 52. I, actually, no, not 1912, because the, the 1916 Olympics didn't happen until World War I, but 1912. Okay. And then in 1917 is when you have the Bolshevik Revolution, which is uh, when the communists take over the Soviet Union, take over Russia. Okay, so from 1912 to 1952, you said the Soviet Union was not in so when they came to join, did they not receive pushback or opposition? Or? Well, the Olympics are inherently political, but they're supposed to not be political. The Olympics are supposed to be a space where you know the nations come together for peace and prosperity. And so you couldn't not allow them. Okay. Uh, although it was very clear that what was going on in the Olympics was a battle for, for supremacy and which society um, can claim preeminence because this is one of the few areas where there was direct competition between the two. Any other questions? <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about? I hope that was helpful. I felt like I was all over the place. Thank you. You tied a lot of things together that I haven't done well, so I appreciate you. I appreciate oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I kind of go way back. Turn this off before you start telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I wish we could stay two hours. I know there are more questions, but I got to stop before these folks try to kick in the door and I have to tell them something about themselves. Um, <laughs> thanks again.